this hangout on air is live. Yay. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our second Living Candida free hangout. I'm Ricky Heller, as some of you know from RickyHeller.com, where I post recipes that are free of eggs, dairy, gluten, and refined sugars. And they're suitable for a low sugar or anti candida diet. And those are the kinds of recipes I publish. I'm also the co-author of the book, Living Candida Free, with Andrea Nakayama, who's here tonight. And I really do believe that a healthy lifestyle can be sweet. So I'll let Andrea introduce herself. Take it away, Andrea. Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm Andrea Nakayama. I am owner and founder of Replenish PDX and Holistic Nutrition Lab. And most importantly, I'm a functional nutritionist, which means I work with the whole person swimming upstream, looking for the root causes of whatever ails you, and I'm also the co-author of Living Candy to Free with Ricky Heller, which was a real joy to work on our, so many of our approaches to how to eat are in tandem. Last time in our Google Hangout, we talked a little bit about some of the differences, but everything you said, gluten-free, dairy-free, egg-free, sugar-free, those are the principles I work with most of the time. Yeah, and so, and not just with food, I think we are in tandem with a lot of things. And yeah. So good to see you, girlfriend, tonight. Thank you. So let's take it away, because you did mention sugar-free, so that's our, our major topic tonight. We're talking about how can you navigate the holidays, or can you navigate the holidays, on a sugar-free diet and the kinds of issues that come up, the kinds of difficulties that people have. And I will just start by saying for everybody out there, both Andrea and I do this. We're going to do it this year. We've been doing it for quite some time, living sugar-free, and, you know, life goes on. And it's really not as difficult as you think. So I thought it would be interesting, Andrea, if we maybe start by talking a little bit about why people might want to choose a sugar-free holiday, year, <laughs> life, um, and some of the perils of succumbing. If you have been sugar-free and maybe you think, oh, I'll just you know, go back to sugar for the holidays, uh, what are some of the issues that you would think are important to note? Yeah, so physiologically, there's a lot of reasons, especially if we're talking about refined sugar, that are detrimental to our health. So uh, first and foremost, I like to remind people that sugar is robbing minerals from the body. So in order for a refined food, like refined sugar, to be digested, it starts to take the other elements from your body that it needs. Now, that all sounds really obscure, like who cares, it's robbing minerals from my body, but those minerals are things we need for other biochemical activities. The one that I find really drives it home for people is when it comes to our hormones. I work with a lot of people with thyroid issues, and we need certain minerals. We need our magnesium, our zinc, our selenium. We all need that for our immune systems. So when we're starting to rob these minerals, we're, we're eating something that's taking something that we need for all our other body functions. The other one that I think is really important to note is how our blood sugar affects all of our hormones, particularly our cortisol levels. That's our flight or fight or flight mechanisms and how when we are going on sugar highs and lows, we're going into fight or flight both when we're high and when we're low. And that starts to deplete our energy stores, our enthusiasm for life, what we're able to do with our day, and in turn that has a cascade or a domino effect on the expression of all of our, our, our other hormones. So that would be number two. And the third one I want to mention, and I can go on and on and on as you know, but the third one I want to mention is sugar is mo one of the most inflammatory substances we can eat. And most of the issues that people are dealing with today, including you and I, are inflammatory in nature. So we want to do everything we can to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, and sugar goes way over in the realm of inflammation. Yeah, absolutely. I love all three of those, and I don't even know if, if you know this. Going back to your first point, I was diagnosed with osteopenia, I think back in like 2009 or something, 
And I believe it's a direct result of all those years of eating sugar because the you know it's so acidic in the body, and it as you said, it leaches the minerals. And so for me, that was a huge issue. I mean, I, I kind of freaked out, and I know that they, that may they don't talk about eating a lot of sugar as one of the risk factors of osteopenia. And certainly, as someone who exercised at the time, I was walking like six days a week, seven days a week, and treadmill and weights because I've been exercising for many, many years, and I was a little bit overweight, which is supposed to be, a, you know, one of the um, one of the conditions that helps to prevent osteopenia. So I was really ticked off. I thought, you know, I, all these things, and I'm still got, I've still gotten it. But it, I, then I made the connection, and a change of diet a year later, my numbers were great. But I think that's a huge a consequence that a lot of women don't think about is, you know, you're so concerned about uh, about your bone health as you get older. Something to really keep in mind. Um, and also, for me, I would add one more. It's really addictive. So, you know, one little slip. I know in my case, this is how my flare of candida back in 2009 all started, was 10 years of being really feeling great, being healthy on the diet after having done the candida cleanse 10 years before. And I felt so great, I thought, one Christmas, I'll have some of the things I like, just a few things, which then, of course, ballooned into, you know, picking out, and then three months later, there I was again with another flare-up. So lots of reasons to try to pre prevent that from happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is a really good one to add, the addictive quality of the sugar, and that often one little piece isn't one little piece. It does go on and on because it triggers something in our brains that makes us want more. And that's where I think, you know, it, the whole, the techniques that we adopt to make it through the holidays are important. Yeah. So let's talk about the techniques that we adopt. And I just want to um, say, for anybody who's watching live, tonight. If you have any questions you'd like us to address about candida, sugar, candida and sugar, the holidays and sugar, anything around that topic, please um, post them right there on the Google Hangout event page and I'm going to be refreshing the page and checking uh, to make sure because we, we were supposed to have a Q&A and I, I clearly just can't figure out how to do this Q&A. So I thought I enabled it and I don't see um, the the uh, column for people to type their questions. So just feel free to put them on the, the Google Hangout page and I'll go check for them. So, um, so we each wanted to think about what are some of the strategies that we use. And we are actually going to share with you tonight some of our best strategies from Andrea's boss course, You're Not the Boss of Me, which is about balancing sugar in the body, which I am um, honored and delighted to co-teach with her. And so, and also from our book, um, Living Candida Free, we talk about some of these principles as well. So my favorite one, which is actually, um, Andrea, kind of an offshoot of, your, of one of yours, is no is easier than maybe. And that's how I express that. And we talk about this in the Candida Kickstart course where um, I work through the beginnings of the Candida diet with people. And Andrea talks, talks about this a lot as well in Boss, where for certain things, an absolute no is actually an easier answer and an easier mindset than allowing yourself to debate about it and think about the possibility. And so the example that I always give is, you know, if you have little kids and they ask you, oh, can I get a new bicycle or can I have this toy in the store, as soon as you say maybe, then the debate goes on for hours and they never leave, leave up on that topic. But if you say no, it's over. That means no, they're not going to ask. Well, they may ask again, but they know the answer is no. Similarly, if somebody has an allergy, they know that they can't. If you have an anaphylactic reaction to something, let's say a really severe reaction to something, say peanuts because that's such an obvious one, you go to a restaurant, you just know you're not going to order something with peanuts. You don't think, maybe I'll just have this square that has a few peanuts sprinkled on top, and it's just a little bit, and it really won't be so terrible. The answer is no, and it's much easier, I find, psychologically to remain in that mindset. And so for me, I think of sugar, certainly at this point in my life, it's like something to which I, I it's, a, it's a similar level of seriousness as something to which I might have an anaphylactic reaction in my mind and psychologically and emotionally. And so I never, that's the one thing I have never debated about since I've been on the anti-candida diet. I might 
wonder if I'm allowed to, you know, I might sneak sneak some nutritional yeast sometimes or as I'm feeling better I might think oh I can have pasta but I have never once been tempted to have anything with white sugar in it I just it's not on the path right it's just not there and I think for me that has worked the best I I can still have sweet treats things that are sweetened with healthy sweeteners and even over time as you get to stage two and stage three you can have things with coconut sugar or agave if those are okay with you if you're okay with those but for me refined sugar is just no and I'm okay with that I I don't even have to worry about it it just never enters my head I can go to social events weddings whatever those things don't tempt me because yeah. I just know I'm not allowed and I and I have that similar principle where I call it the path the bike lane and the poison ivy and what we each do is define what that is for ourselves and to your point Ricky there's that there's that psychological place where no is easier than maybe but that's also as we discuss in boss a physiological response too where if you're in the maybe or should I place you're releasing dopamine and you want the release of more dopamine. So should I or maybe so becomes actually a painful experience as opposed to no, I don't. So that's what I relegate over to the poison ivy. And just as you're talking about anything with refined sugar is in the poison ivy for me. I actually have an immune response to sugar. I have a delayed IgG, that's a sensitivity response. And when I eat sugar, it shows up pretty clearly. I get puffiness around my eyes. I can tell if something had sugar in it the next day when I woke up, like if I went out and there was just the tiniest bit of sugar. So I'm really careful with that because I don't want to be brought down. It's not worth it to me. I don't want to wake up and feel puffy. And we each make those decisions for ourselves. What is this worth to me? Where am I willing to take a risk? And that's where the bike lane exists. So the sweeteners that are in the bike lane for me are coconut sugar and yacon syrup and maybe some dates or dried fruit for me. That's what is going to li live in the bike lane. The refined sugar is way over in the poison ivy. Honey, maple syrup, even those are in the poison ivy for me because they're too high glycemic for my system. Really, the only sweetener that's solidly in the path for me is stevia. But that doesn't mean that over the holidays, I might not ride in the bike lane for a little bit and then come back to my path. So I think that structure is really important for us all to define so that we can say no to what we've decided to say no to, and that's what we know doesn't work for us and then find our places where we can say yes without having to say maybe. Yes, I think that that's a great way of looking at it. And I'm so similar. I also, to my great chagrin, I cannot have maple syrup anymore either. I It just doesn't agree with me. And I think over time you learn what that is for you. I mean, we might say white sugar is a no for everyone or no one is good with white sugar however some people might be okay with maple syrup occasionally some people ultimately might be okay with other sweeteners um, but for me yeah it, it's the, the once in a while tend to be coconut sugar agave very rarely because of all the issues around agave these days but because I'm a baker I will use agave in some baked goods that I want to remain sort of light colored <laughs> So it's all aesthetic. It's all about what it looks like. <laughs> you know, you can't make sugar cookies. Well, you can make sugar cookies with coconut sugar, but then they'll be kind of brown and, you know, not as appealing. So I'll have a agave once in a while. And yacon for sure. And I'm. Um, some people have been asking me about this in the Candida Kickstart, and I've only recently started experimenting with a xylitol, which I avoided for a long time. But because it, it is so well known for combating candida, I thought I would give it a try. So I've just started to experiment a little bit with that too. So the thing I want to say, I'm I'm okay to use xylitol as well. I'm it works fine with my system. It can be very irritating to people yes. who have any sort of IBS or IBD 
or have any issues uh, with fructose malabsorption. More and more people are, are familiar with FODMAP diets these days. People who have FODMAP or fructose malabsorption issues are going to have a hard time with xylitol. So I just want to say if anybody's trying xylitol for the first time, first of all, use a natural form of xylitol like the birch xylitol. Um, but also just trial a little bit. Don't go and replace your sugar and your sugar cookies with xylitol because you will be in the bathroom with a lot of uh, dehydration. <laughs> That's yeah. one way to put it. So yeah, I just be careful if you're trying xylitol for the first time. Yeah, and on that same note, what's fascinating to me about it is so many people with candida are are have difficulties with constipation. So xylitol, because it can cause diarrhea, for some for some reason a lot of people with candida actually do okay with xylitol because it just regulates them rather than causing diarrhea. So but you should always try, yeah, just a little bit at a time. So um, okay, do you want to share one of your other strategies, Andrea? That for me is definitely a great strategy of just knowing what's in the parameters for myself. I also always make a point of showing up for myself and not trying to please everybody else. So there's a couple of aspects to that. Now, one lesson I learned the hard way was going to my mother-in-law's for Christmas. We spent, tend to spend Christmas with my mother-in-law and it's lovely and it's hard to feed us because my diet is often a moving target. And there was one night she was making something for dinner that I don't eat. I, at that time, considered it to be in my poison ivy, but I kind of widened the bike lane for her. As a result, because I didn't want to insult her and what she had made, I was up all night in the bathroom and uncomfortable. So I realized in that moment that nobody at that event is there to take care of me but me. And it's not my job to take care of her. I don't need to insult her. But there's ways to judiciously and diplomatically say, I'm not going to eat that because I'm not sure how my body's going to react to it. So don't, please don't be offended. I've made X that I and everybody else can eat. So that's the other part in the two-part scenario there for me. First is that I need to show up for myself and nobody's there to take care of me but me. And second is I always make sure there is something I can eat. I never show up anywhere empty-handed, and I usually show up with a savory and a sweet so that if I'm tempted in any direction, I know I've taken care of myself. There are things that I can have on hand that I'm going to be happy to eat and partake in the festivities around me without feeling left out. Yeah, I love that, and I, I often recommend that as well, because I, for years, always brought something with me, but I love your idea of bringing one savory and one sweet, and, you know, as I tell people, that way you're covered for any course or any part of the evening. The appetizers, you're savory. The dessert, you're sweet. The, the dinner, you're savory. So, because sometimes I think it's just so important to be standing there, you know, you're, there's all this small talk or there's a buffet table or something like that, it's so important to be seen have with something on your plate, right? And so if you can put one of your, whatever it is that you brought with you, I mean, most places will have veggies and dip. You know, um, I was at a party over the weekend at a friend's house, and I, I, I did, I, and this is another tip that a lot of people will talk about, which is to eat a little something before you go. And so I do that. So I knew I wasn't going to starve. But, you know, we were there for like two and a half, three hours. And I had hummus and um, baby carrots for the whole time because <laughs> and mineral water because that was the only thing there that I could eat. And I, you know, I'm okay with that. That's fine because I was there to socialize and I had already eaten. But had I brought something um, and that day I didn't have time, I would have I would have been able to eat that as well. So I think it's really important to yeah take care of yourself. Can I piggyback on that just with yeah. a little tip? Because this is such an important time of year, and then I know you have another really great tip right in your hands that you can share with us. But towards that end, what Ricky was talking about, I like to call it opting in. 
So you get to opt in to whatever part of it you want to opt into. That can be where you're going to eat or not eat, where you're going to socialize, whether you're going to drink. There was a certain point where I was going out with girlfriends and realized I don't feel good drinking anymore and stopped drinking but realized nobody cared that I wasn't drinking as long as I opted into the conversation. I didn't have to eat anything with them. I didn't have to drink anything with them. All I had to do was be present and nobody cared. And if they said, do you want to have a drink? I would just say, I'm not drinking right now. But keep the conversation going. So I like to remind people to opt in, opt into the festivities. You don't need to stand apart in the corner because you're eating differently than everybody else at the party. You can opt into other aspects of it. Yeah, for sure. And, and obviously, when you say you stop drinking, you mean stop drinking alcohol, right? <laughs> water or what you're drinking. Yeah, so you're, you're still drinking, just not alcohol. Yeah, so um, my, yeah, my other tip is go green, right? So I brought this just to show people because this is also what, um, part of my dinner tonight. But this is my green juice. And um, for me, greens and green juices are essential, an essential part of my remaining sugar-free in a way that's comfortable because I, I know, you know, if you read about quitting sugar or if you're new to quitting sugar, um, one of the things that comes up often, I remember reading this many times at the beginning, is that it takes about a week for your sugar cravings to dissipate, for you to lose your sugar cravings. And Andrea knows, I've, I've said this before, that is totally not my experience. Yeah. That did not happen to me. How long have I been off sugar? Like 10, 15 years? I still have sugar cravings, so I have sweet cravings. I won't say I have sugar cravings. So for me, I find drinking, you know, the green drink isn't just specifically because it's green, because a green drink is highly alkaline. I've got kale in here, celery, cilantro. I, I, I put in a little garlic in my juice. A green drink is going to be very, very alkalizing, and I find the more I alkalize, the less I crave sugar. And I, that's physically because it's combating that acidity, but I just think that um, for whatever reason, when I start the day that way or when I continue the day that way, I tend not to crave. The more green I drink, the more green I eat, the less I even think about sweet things. Yeah. So that, that would be another, another tip for me. Yeah, a great one. That's a great one. Thank you. And now I love my green drinks. You know, you can put a little fruit in it if you're okay with fruit, but um, I'm at the point where I they're just green, right? There's some lemon juice in there, and that's that's my fruit in it. So did you have anything else you wanted to share? About, I think, just in navigating the holidays, I think it's it, number one for me is, is really that know thyself and take care of yourself. So... As much as you can move into the holiday season, knowing what works for you and what doesn't work for you and being true to yourself, that is, I think, the biggest tip we could all use and be reminded of this time of year. I'm, I'm grateful for the reminder myself. Yeah, and I think we're so... And you know we, we're so aware of caring about others around this time of year. It's a, it's a time of year where that's part of what comes out for so many people, but what about self-care? I think that's so crucial too, and, and that this is part of it, is taking care of yourself and being aware of what's healthy for you. Yeah. So um, I know we have some questions, so before I, I'm going to get to the questions, I'm going to go take a look at the uh, Google Hangout page, but I just really quickly want to mention for those people who read my blog, or even if you don't, there I do have a mega giveaway for the holidays, speaking of thinking about other people, on my blog, and it ends tonight at 11.59 p.m. So if you want to be eligible to win one of those two prize packs with more than 20 gifts, these are ingredients and tools that I use all the time, and they're all sugar-free and um, gluten-free and vegan and candida-friendly, please go to my blog, rickyheller.com, and enter. There's a separate giveaway for Canada and a separate one for the U.S., so um, if you're in North America, anybody can enter, and it ends at 11:59, so you don't have to rush off this second. You can go at the end of the at the end of the hangout. And um, just a reminder too that we have a special bonus for people who pre-order Living Candida free, and you can just email or um, I'm sorry, not email. There's a a page on my blog. 
Uh, it's rickyheller.com forward slash um, LCF, which stands for Living Candida Free Bonus. So LCF Bonus. If you go to that page and key in your receipt number and your email, you will receive the 10 recipe ebook packet for free on the day that the book is published. And when you receive your book, you'll get our ebook with it. And these are 10 recipes that are all Candida friendly. Obviously, they, they would fit with the protocols in our book. And um, they're not in the book, and they're not on my blog. So two brand new recipes for you guys. OK, so let's go see what some of these questions are here. I see a couple. So can you reference any information about candida being the cause of burning tongue syndrome? Did you want to grab that one, Andrea? Sure. You know, there's, so burning tongue syndrome, what I do know about it and what I've seen is that it affects more women than men and that it can, the, the derivation, there could be different derivations. So candida is definitely one of them and it is often thought of as one of the tests you want to do if somebody does present with burning tongue syndrome. So there is a correlation there as well as to other infections. There could be other infections at play. There could also be nutrient or vitamin deficiencies just as we were talking about earlier that can be the result of eating more refined foods. So what I think of with burning tongue is always look for the root cause, swim upstream like I was saying and figure out why that might be the case. So in addition to knowing, oh it might be candida and that needs to be tested or treated, what other nutrient deficiencies might be present? Okay, so I know that a lot of the people who would, were watching would would be here because of the candida connection. So, what are some of the? So, first of all, burning tongue syndrome. Obviously, the symptoms are a burning tongue. Uh, is this something that presents the way oral thrush would present, where you would see the white coating on the tongue as well, or is that not always the case with burning? Not tongue? always the case. It can definitely be just the sensation, and it's often considered part of burning mouth syndrome, so the entire mouth can be affected, the tongue can be affected. If you know you have candida, then addressing that, watching that as one of your signs and symptoms that you're watching as an indicator, whether you're in a flare or not in a flare, and then also simultaneously addressing any infection we want to be aiming to eat a nutrient-dense diet and getting any nutrients in our diet that we may have deficiency in, bringing those up to sufficiency, and also looking at um, how we digest and absorb the nutrient-dense diet that we're eating. So what is digestive health like? We know with candida that there's likely a compromise. So working on the entire thing, knowing that there's no quick fix, but the burning tongue is likely a symptom of a lot of stuff that's happening at, upstream that you want to be addressing. Yeah. Okay, and the other question I'm, I assume people would want to know is what would be a, a test that there are there one or two major tests that they would normally ask for if they suspect that it's connected to candida? Well, I think the first and first and foremost, we want to look to see if there is candida from, I'm a fan of testing for candida, so we know the levels, we know what kind of intervention we need to bring in, so I like either a stool analysis or an organic acids test, which is urine, shows the metabolites from the bacteria and the yeast, so those are my two favorite methods for testing if there's yeast. But then we also just want to look at a CBC, a complete blood count, and looking at what's happening with the immune system. We want to look at vitamin D levels. If somebody's more advanced than that and they're able to look at something like a nutri eval where they're looking at actual uh, nutrient sufficiency in the body, you can go there. But we want to do what's right at the place and time that we're working with. So first and foremost, is there candida? How do I address that appropriately for my condition? Okay. So basically there's no easy answer, but you're looking at just overall health too, right? Yeah, overall health. I mean, this is, I, I work with a lot of people with candida, with other chronic 
infections that manifest maybe in autoimmune conditions. And one of the things we have to learn is how to manage it. It's not just one pill or one doctor or one method. It's how we're living our life, which is what you and I are talking about now. How do we manage these conditions? And all those signs and symptoms, burning tongue being one of them, are things you want to be watching for and noting to see where you are, or if they're going away, or when do they go away, or what days don't you feel it, or what makes it worse. Doing that level of self-evaluation, as opposed to always looking at where's the next test, or where's the next doctor, or where's the next pill, or where's the next supplement. Tune into, oh, the days I don't sleep as well, that makes my tongue feel worse, or you know whatever it is, when we bring that attention to it, we get a lot more information to support ourselves. Yeah, so important, and I think, yeah, just also, again, it goes back to taking responsibility for your own health, too, I think. Um, okay, so there's one more here. This is from Carla F., which I got via email. Um, what do you do when your family or friends try to sabotage you during the holidays by inviting you to eat just this one piece or just or it's just one piece? What do you do in those situations? So that's... I think a very common problem that people have, whether they're on a sugar-free diet or they have allergies or gluten, certainly I know a lot of friends who are gluten-free, they've been told, oh, come on, it's just one piece of bread, it's not going to hurt you kind of thing. Um, so I, well, we can, eat, we, uh, we can each tell what we do, but uh, for me, I find you can, pull, and then you actually alluded to this earlier, Andrea, when you were talking about going places with, and with your mother-in-law, but you know, I will respectfully say no thanks. I, I, I won't even necessarily explain because I, I find the more you try to explain, the more people try to convince you that that's not a good reason. So if I say, well, I'm on a sugar-free diet, they go, oh, well, so what? A little bit of sugar is not going to hurt you. And I find you get into this debate which really goes nowhere. So rather than even give an excuse, I would just say, no thanks, I'd rather not right now. Given that, there will still be people who try to push you. And in those situations, I will accept whatever it is on my plate. I might slice a little corner off and push it aside so it looks like it was touched, and then I will not touch it. I will leave it on my plate, and I just won't eat it. And I find that works. They, sometimes people, you know, I, I, I've been in places where people are offended if you don't eat the cake they baked or you don't eat the whatever it is they're serving because they took time and they want to feel appreciated. So I will just take a little serving and then I will not eat it. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things that come up for me. First of all, nobody would do that to me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I know you too well at this point. <laughs> nobody would try to do that to me because um, they know what they're going to get in return. Uh, you know, nobody can sabotage your efforts except you. So you, ha it really is about, and that sounds harsh, but I use that as an invitation to you to find the techniques that are going to work for you. The number one thing I want to say that reflects what you said, Ricky, is no soapboxes. You don't need to convince anybody why you're doing it or why they might benefit from it. Just to know thank you or I'm not able to is fine. Um, you know, I... I, the example I'm thinking of is when I go to the airport, I never go through the, the little screening thing anymore. I have Hashimoto's, I have autoimmune thyroiditis, so I get a pat down every time and I travel a lot. And yes. when I have clients travel, they'll tell me, oh, I always feel like I have to tell them why I have MS or I have blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you don't have to tell them a thing. I just say, I need a pat down. And that's all that happens. So in this same situation, I, I don't eat sugar is fine. If you feel like you need to talk to the host ahead of time and just say, your cake is beautiful, just so you know, I'm not able to eat sugar right now, but I'm going to appreciate everybody else enjoying it. Sometimes I make a joke out of it, like with my mother-in-law, like, you poor thing, how could you keep up with what I'm eating this year? <laughs> Last year I didn't eat meat, this year I do eat meat. Like, I just joke about how difficult I am, so it lets them off the hook and brings me into the joke, even if they need to joke at me, I can laugh with it too. But I never lecture to in those situations. 
I like that a lot, but never in those situations. That's a great idea because, you know, last time I flew, well, it, it, the last time I flew was the first time I have flown since they've had these x-ray things. And I just said, I prefer not to go there. It was fine. No questions. I had the pat down, like, who cares? And the funny thing is, as you're telling me this, I'm thinking, man, your family's a lot nicer than my family <laughs> because... If I just said, no thanks, I'm not able, I, I'm, in the past I have gotten those kinds of questions. Now they don't question me anymore. But initially, a lot of that, oh, come on, and you know, it's really, it's, what, what's so bad, or oh, you're a crazy diet. And so I think a lot of people find themselves in that situation. And I like the idea of yeah, not... It's a crazy diet. Yeah, just say, like, it is a crazy diet. Like, yeah, just yeah. list somebody to support you. If the host or your mom or your sister just say, I'm not going to eat that now. So yeah. if people start in on me, just help me deflect it. Get somebody to be your advocate, your partner, whatever it is. Yeah. Also, just don't make a big deal of it. I just say, no, thank you. Um, my family, you know, can be aggressive about things, but they're not going to go there with me about that. And I think people can sense if you're feeling insecure about it. So the more confident you are and the more convinced you are that this is something you are going to do, then the easier it's going to be in that situation. So that would be what I would suggest to people is just be confident in your own choices and this is what's good for you and no debate, no argument, just as Andrea said, no thank you. There's one more thing. I know we're over time, but I just want to share one more are you okay if I share one? Of course, yeah, of course. You know, so people may or may not know my story that brought me into nutrition, but I lost my husband to a brain tumor over 12 years ago, and he lived with that brain tumor for two and a half years, and during that time, that's when I removed sugar. I was pregnant at the time, and we removed sugar first because we understood how it fed aberrant cells, like cancer cells. So that was one of the first moves we made. We made a lot of other dietary changes during that time. But we used to joke that um, our friends who made dietary changes would go home and get this pressure that you're talking about. We would never get that pressure because we were fighting a very known to be serious illness. So. People, I would joke that we could come home in orange robes and say it was for the good of the cancer, like fighting the cancer, and our families, you know, would, who would otherwise be completely weirded out by that would be completely on board because we were fighting something lethal. Yes. When we are dealing with something that is chronic, it's more hidden. So whether that's candida or autoimmunity or Lyme disease or some other infection, it's hidden and it's hard for our families to understand how much that affects our lives. So just understanding sympathetically that they don't know what you're experiencing and why you're making these decisions. It's not your job to explain it to them, but understanding that if they did understand, they would never, they would never ask you to do That's something right. that was going to harm you. They love you, and it's coming from a place of wanting to include you, but they don't understand your pain and suffering. Yeah, and I think that, that for sure, so many of these chronic issues are invisible, and that's part of the problem. So, uh, you know, it's really up to us to convey that this is something that's important to us, and you can do that in a really quiet and confident way without getting into any kind of arguments because it's the holidays and we want to <laughs> all enjoy each other's company, right? So I hope that gives you some ideas and Andre and I are both going to be enjoying our sugar-free holiday. I wanted to also offer you something delicious to eat over the holidays so you don't feel like you're missing anything sweet. So the last thing I'm going to say is I've been posting a lot about this on my Facebook page and on Instagram and I made a huge batch of my um, chocolate peppermint bark with a protein boost it's called. So this is a great recipe. I have been making it with xylitol the last few times and it works beautifully. So if you just, I guess you can just Google it and I will put the link on the Google event page as well and if you're looking at this video on YouTube I'll put the link to the recipe under the video. It's called chocolate protein bark with a protein boost and you can just Google Ricky Heller chocolate protein bark with a protein boost and you will have a delicious sweet treat that you would be proud to bring to parties and also munch on all throughout the holidays. So, 
Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Andrea, great to see you, as always. Yeah, great to hang out with everybody. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks, everyone. Have a great holiday. And don't forget to enter that giveaway if you're watching this. Tonight at 11.59, last chance. <laughs> All right, take care. Good night. Good night.